Personalment coneixia el... I personally knew Ramon as a student of the Faculty of Geography and History, and he had this ability, this skill of summarizing, and he's exactly the same now. And Carlota and Uriol were also great. And we need to be happy because we have a new generation that, and it's in their hands now. It was in ours, but now it's in their hands, and we have to be really proud, no matter our budget constraints here at the university. Having reached this point now that we have um, our um, Students sitting here, we will start with a Q&A, with a discussion for the three students, and then we will ask the rest, the previous speakers from the previous roundtable to come on stage later, and then we will have the next questions. Do you have any questions for our students to start? On the microphone, please. I would like to ask Mr. Romero whether in hospitals, you considered that there was also these maybe changes in the ranking at the military or, but have you thought about the hospital resources because most of them had to be operated. They had to, some many surgery operations had to be performed. Have you taken this into account? Maybe it was due to resource constraints. And are you aware of Dr. Trueva's progresses in surgery? Uh, Dr. Trueta, uh, did he participate in these surgery processes? Can you hear me well? In the I mean, in, in the case of wounds, you're asking me whether patients were sent to a particular hospital or another, depending on the type of injury, but they were previously selected, and then they were sent. But it did not make much sense, in my opinion, to send a patient from the front line to a hospital, because if you select that hospital, you select that patient, you select that depending on the type of injury. If that patient has a broken leg, you will not refer that patient to a pulmonology specialized hospital. That would make no sense. So probably, at first, patients were sent to a particular hospital depending on the type of doctors or equipment they needed. But then, due to many reasons, uh, whether it, it was hospital capacity or bombarding, because in Mataró there were some bombings, I wouldn't say constantly, but there were some bombings for weeks. And maybe that was the reason for these transfer for, of patients from one hospital to the other. Um, maybe that could explain that. In the case of that Dr. Trueta, I knew what his work was, especially when it came to blood transfusions and the new methodologies for surgery he devised, Mataró had a pool of doctors at the time who were really good and who invented new ways of operating. But, but it's not a special case, actually. There was a lot of medical progress at the time. Um, but I was my work is devoted to uh, the question of why these um, patients were sent from one hospital to the other. And when it comes to rear guard um, hospitals, they were like redistribution hospitals that would redistribute brigaders depending on the reality of the hospital because at the front line, at the battlefield, they may send a patient to a um, hospital specialized in traumatology. But once there, there may be other factors that may be involved in this transfer of patients from one hospital to another. For example, from the hospital of Mataró to another rear guard hospital. And maybe it was due to lack of resources or due to other factors. I think it's your work is really interesting, and I would like to ask something to Mr. Romero. From my 
personal perspective, I think it's incredibly important what you are doing. Because when I started working as other people in this room, trying to find somebody who disappeared, the first place I went to were hospitals. And in a letter, one of his friends wrote to my grandmother saying that probably there were more injured people in Barcelona if they just wounded, um, if it's a mild wound, they're on the coast, if they're severely wound in Barcelona. But if you can confirm this, that would be good. And another thing I would like to say is that one hospital changed the name of my granddad, for example, and then the Red Cross was not looking for Oleg Zuk, but Oleg Zink, right? My, there, were, there was a change in the spelling of my granddad, or, and now we have this double, Oleg Zun, Oleg Zin, and that happened at a hospital, but I think it's absolutely fantastic that you do this tracking work, this tracking task, and I would like to congratulate Sibrit and Lourdes, because thanks to this wonderful data database, you can go to the primary sources, not secondary sources, but primary sources. And it's super important to be able to compare, as you have realized, sometimes we have conflicting views. And this is when our work as researchers makes sense. Thank you very much. Oh, and I also have a question, another another little question for Dr. Sanchez, for Carlota. A question for Carlota. Carlota, could you please tell me? It's very interesting what you said, but one question is, what were these women doing before? What were they doing before? These women came here, and they were already fighting. Many of them had been in prison for a long time, and they had been trained not just as educated women, but they wanted to improve the world. They were already activists. so. I think it would be interesting to know about that, about their origin. Thanks. First and foremost, thank you so much for your kind words. And Lourdes, I would like to say that without your project, our work would have been impossible. Almost all the information we got and all the ability to compare brigade our data with one another, it would have been impossible without your database. Because sometimes I'm looking for a German name and release bringing is a database that helps you compare and helps you identify these brigaders in an easier way. When it comes to these changes in names and also in military ranks, this is still an open question in my opinion. Changes in names, I guess, argue to the fact that sometimes patients would be admitted to the hospital and it was not the patient who changed their name, but the doctor instead who would just not listen or understand the sermon correctly and would just make a spelling mistake. And of course, Admissions are never, never come in isolation. Sometimes you've got 30 admissions very quickly, and you need to be very quick, and these mistakes could happen. In the case of military rankings, maybe this could be due to the fact that they wanted to get a better treatment. If you were a plain soldier, maybe you would not get the nicest of food. Um, diets, so maybe by changing the rank, for, or maybe if they were being referred to evacuation hospitals, or even more importantly, to improvement hospitals or recovery hospitals, if nobody knew what the military rank was, maybe their destination would be better. As in the case of Xenophobia, 
who was in Mataró, then he went to um, Santa Coloma de Farnes, and he ends up saying um, he was a captain, and they sent him to the Pyrenees, and he was captured, and he was sent back to the hospital to transfer him somewhere else, because they realized he wasn't a captain. But, well, that they sometimes did to get a better destination. They did it to get a better destination. Okay. It's true that many of the women who have been classified in the database that was created for international female volunteers, many of them had already belonged to political parties like the Swiss Communist Party, for example, or others, depending on the origin. But I particularly couldn't find any women who had been arrested or fined in the um, literature that I reviewed. I couldn't see the archives, but I checked the literature and I couldn't find these previous crimes or previous experiences. What I could find was the fact that many of them mention a father who had uh, raised this engagement or commitment in them, who had motivated that. But experiences, I couldn't find. That does not mean that they do not exist. Obviously, I just had a limited set of um, women in my database. It's 200 women only. It's just a representative sample, considering the available information. But it's just an example. There are other archives where we could really um, really widen this. This, is, this has to be taken with a pinch of salt, as I said at the beginning. And we have to pay attention to other, more comprehensive studies. Are there any more questions? I have a question for Carlota. Considering the fact that international brigades live on the 38th or 1938, my question has to do with women who were brigaders during the Civil War. Militians, women, were considered not heroines, but prostitutes instead. And some men really even criticized them. My question is whether international brigaders stayed until 1938, or if some left earlier to other places. Or if, I mean, there, it was a small number of them, but did they leave on the 38 with the rest of brigaders, or did, did they start leaving earlier than that? That's my question. Okay. I will answer in Spanish, if you don't mind, because of translation. Um, thanks, but women fighting in the front line, in the battlefield, it was a very reduced number. Militians as you said, would last for a short period of time, and they were not treated as if they were heroines at all. As a matter of fact, for this, we should see the Meninash study. In the case of international brigaders, women were so few, they were such a small number that most of them were devoted to tasks that are very much related to the female archetype, and they would stay in Spain until the moment the brigades left. Some would finish, would end up in, some ended up in concentration camp. Others reached their countries. Others died in the rear guard even. So in principle, as most of them were not in the battlefield, but were just executing this type of translation, interpreting, carrying tasks. They stayed, they, they were in Spain until the brigades left, until the very end. And in, uh, if there are no more further questions, we will now have the other people, the other speakers. Uh, they, by the way, I would like to say that um, the students said they were nervous, but they did a great task. So a huge round of applause.